Hello, football fans. Welcome to week nine of the Scuff Football Podcast. Uh, for the you couldn't see it, but this is attempt number two because the recording didn't start. Uh, this is Noah. I'm Ted. We're here to cover the previous week, talk stories, scores, fantasy, gambling, the whole nine yards from this week of football. Um, we're going to start in a more traditional sense, uh, you know, just basic cut and dry, covering scores, seeing what we watched because neither one of us really had a huge opportunity to watch a ton of football this weekend. The one thing we mentioned in the first run, not to bore ourselves, um, was just the difference between the Bengals and the Browns last night as a, as a starting point. Um, we we talked that the Bengals had been doing really well so far this season, but the Browns offense looked relatively unstoppable, especially in the second half. It felt like Joe Burrow and Joe Mixon both couldn't get things started for uh, Cincinnati. Just very interesting to see that game be so far apart. Um Noah mentioned the first run through of this before, you know, I hit the record button um, that both of us did pick Cincinnati to look a whole lot better. And we were kind of surprised that the Browns just didn't do it. Uh, We were starting to get to the Giants and the Seahawks, uh, mentioning that the Giants defense had been carrying them so long this season. And even though we'd been praising Seattle's offense, um, it was very strange to see the Giants get so dismantled. Um, I guess to move on from there again, not to repeat ourselves for, literally only ourselves. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the Dolphins and the Lions. Um, So that game ended uh, with the Dolphins winning 31-27. I think both of us picked the Dolphins to win that game and to cover, which they did. Um, But I think this was a much closer game than I was expecting it to be. I thought Tua with a a weekend game last week uh, and then being able to come in and play against a not so great Lions defense, I really thought the Dolphins were going to score a lot faster and they were going to probably win this game by more than three and a half. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we had discussed, you know, Lions not being an easy win um, in general. And I mean, like, usually they're closer, but again, against a more offensive, explosive team, I expected the Dolphins to put up more. I expected the Lions to kind of take a step back. So it was still pretty interesting. Um, yeah, it, and it was nice too to see the the Lions offense kind of come back into form. The last two or three times we watched them play, their offense hadn't done a whole lot. And I know earlier this season, like the the Lions offense was what we were kind of praising them for. The things that we were seeing positives were the Lions offense. So it was nice to see them score. Um, but I don't, I guess I don't feel as strongly about the Dolphins now, even back to being healthy as I did a few weeks ago when they were healthy before. To his multiple injuries. Just find it pretty interesting. Uh, another one that interested me um, was the Panthers and the Falcons. Um, Falcons ended up taking this one in overtime, but it was a pretty high scoring affair. Uh, and I guess there's a couple surprises I have with that. Um, both of us actually picked the Falcons, but the Panthers covered. Um, I think both of us said that we expected the Falcons to win. So I, I, I guess I can't be super disappointed with losing the gamble, but I, um, it was interesting to me that the Panthers, even after trading away two uh, two of their bigger skill position guys, were finding quarterback play, were finding offense, had the ability to keep up with the Falcons, who we know score in pretty massive flurries through so far this season. Yeah, again, I agree. We had discussed how much trading away your star piece, and um, we didn't expect them last week to even be as explosive as they were. Um, and I definitely didn't expect it to you know, maintain at that level of play. So... Definitely interesting, but I mean, yeah. Um, and then the last one I had that interested me um, was the Cowboys and the Bears. Um, Dak Prescott coming back his again one week after rejoining his team, playing a full week of offense and scoring 49 points has to be super hopeful for Cowboys fans. However, I think this is, if I'm not mistaken, this is the Bears' best offensive week this season to score 29 points. How worried are we about the Cowboys' defense, even if even though their offense is picked up? Uh, I mean, with the Cowboys, I feel like it's, it's a, you know, it's like a good – there's always a trade-off. Like, I feel like when their offense isn't performing, like, their defense is stout. So, I, I don't really know which one is, like, the, the lesser evil, I guess. But, again, I mean, we've talked about the Bears being better than what – we originally thought so maybe them putting up 29 is just a reflection of maybe how much they've improved and they just had like a really stout week this week um but again i wouldn't be too worried we're only eight games in still so i suppose that's true um 
I guess that kind of brings me into my other point. Uh, la- last week, we talked a bit about the trade deadline, who we expected to buy, who we expected to sell, maybe some pieces that we could see go in some places. Um, and today, now that we're recording as late as we are, um, that means we've surpassed the trade di- deadline at four o'clock Eastern, and we've got a final list of players who have moved. Um, the place I want to start is actually with you in Buffalo. Um I found it very interesting that a team doing so well and beating teams so dominantly felt the need to go out and buy. Uh, They picked up another running back to support Singletary, uh, and they traded out a cornerback for a safety. Um, Although I think that was two separate trades. Net gain is a safety, net loss is a cornerback. Um, How do you feel about Buffalo buying? Um, I mean, again, we've talked to football contenders, and we knew that the Bills were one of them. Um, maybe this is just their way of like kind of ensuring that no matter what happens, like if everything just goes to shit, they'll always have someone, you know, like a reliable backup. So maybe it's just their way of securing, you know, what they think is like the final pieces, you know? Um, so I'm big on it because let's go bills. Yeah. Um, it helps. It helps. So, yeah. I, I, I think the depth at running back is nice. I know that like early before McCaffrey got traded, there was talks that they were in the mix for him. I, I guess my concern is just that Singletary has been doing so well and late in games like Josh Allen feels like he's the one taking over and they're kind of abandoning the run game. I don't having depth is obviously nice. Like I'm never going to complain about depth, but it is interesting to see that that was something that they were so invested in to go and get. Um Beyond that, like I thought the secondary was working, um, so I don't necessarily mind the safety pickup to, again, bolster it, especially if it's not a guy who's going to get starting time. I I was more just surprised to see that Buffalo felt they were in a position where they needed to buy um, when it feels like they're so much better than the division and, quite frankly, the conference. Um, Another team that kind of surprised me was the Jaguars. Um, Last week, I think just before we recorded the podcast, they traded away James Robinson. So I assumed that they were going to start selling. Um, they are the Jaguars. They are in a really di- like not good division that they're still managing to struggle in, and they're on a huge four or five game skid now. But after all of that, they traded away several draft picks to go and pick up Calvin Ridley. Um, that's strange for me because you're bargaining away your future for a guy who can't play now. Is Calvin Ridley still suspended for the season? So it was just kind of losing future value for no immediate return after selling off pieces that are going to, you know, cut into your ability to succeed now. Very strange to me. I mean, at the same time, this might be their way of saying like, all right, well, you know, maybe this season, it's not our season after seeing, you know, other teams be so much better um, than we expected. So maybe it's just them kind of just trying to work towards a future now. And maybe they think that Calvin Ridley is a piece of that. I, I, I honestly don't know. But yeah, again, Trading away something and then not getting something in return is uh, even immediately is just it doesn't seem like a play. Yeah. And and I guess the strange part for me is that like so. So this year specifically, right, we watch teams invest in their young quarterbacks to see what they actually have. Right. The Eagles have done it with Jalen. Uh, Jalen Hurts. The Dolphins did it with Tua where they surround them by big pieces that are playing right this moment. Right. This week specifically, I, I don't know that the Jags were going to march the field and win the game. Uh, Sunday morning against the Broncos, but I did watch Trevor Lawrence throw it significantly behind his receiver to throw an interception. And it doesn't matter if you're throwing to Calvin Rid- Ridley or a tackling dummy. If you're throwing it closer to the defensive back than your receiver, you're going to lose that play. I don't know that a better receiver makes a whole lot of difference there when it seems to be the quarterback that's struggling. And if they're trying to do the same thing in the future to continue bolstering what's around Trevor Lawrence so they actually know what they have. It feels very strange to me that the guy that you're trading for and investing in means losing draft picks, and then you're going to get him after he hasn't played for an entire year. Just just a very strange move to me that I can't make sense of in my head. Um, mm-hmm. Moving on, uh, we got Miami. Um, so they traded away uh, Mostert's backup uh, at the running back position, losing some depth, to pick up Bradley Chubb. Um, I... I want to start by saying that I like Bradley Chubb. I think he's a really good piece on defense, like just absolutely fantastic. But I also don't know that taking away depth from Miami, who's had injury problems and clear issues with the offensive line, was ne- necessarily a smart value to win now. Uh, I mean, I guess if they're also, you know, like we, they're pretty strong. So maybe securing that defense and maybe help bolster. Again, we... Anything that, you know, from what I've heard, they worked really well, uh, Bradley Chubb with, like, Vaughn. So 
he like definitely knows a lot. So again, like I guess maybe just to shore up that defense, maybe get it a little better. Um, I mean, if you know you're still good in offensively, then you know you can risk losing that depth. But again, yeah, depth is pretty important to this team, and you know we've seen it. You know they've been on losing streaks with their backups. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, I I think it's just a strange time for that trade to happen. Like like I said, I I think Bradley Chubb is a very great piece. I think the like net loss versus net gain, the Dolphins definitely won the trade. I just don't know if it's better for their team right now. Um, I, I do think it was a smart move to try and compete with the, with the bills and, you know, maybe bolster their play of, playoff position later on. Um, Minnesota, I thought was another interesting one. Um, so Minnesota, I, in my opinion, already has the best skill position guys in the league. Um, we've talked a bunch about Justin Jefferson. Um, obviously their run game is super strong. Uh, you know, I think they've got enough skill position pieces that we've stopped asking, is Kirk Cousins good? And we've continued to say that he's good enough to be good with those guys. But they added another piece at tight end uh, by picking up Hawkinson from Detroit. Um, So I think this is a huge value play for the Vikings. I think this makes them much more threatening, uh, especially in a really weak NFC. I think this definitely secures their offense as one of the better ones in the league if they weren't already. Jesus. (laughs) um wouldn't be us if it wasn't scuffed but uh i do think the interesting parts of this trade are the fact that detroit was willing to give him up especially to some team within the division um we like we mentioned earlier the lions offense has been really good to give away a piece of that feels very bizarre and then to make sure that the one securing that piece is a team that you have to play twice a year just kind of hit me kind of strange I'm not going to lie. This entire time I was trying to take care of the app that I kind of just blanked you out. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I was, I was talking about the, the Hawkinson trade. Weird to have come from Detroit. Uh, really good for the Vikings, obviously, but strange for Detroit to do it. Um, um, yeah, fair. Yeah, I, I don't know. It just it it strikes me as strange to know that a team you're going to play against twice is willing to give you that talent. Um, it, it, it does really well for the Vikings down the stretch. I mean, I think this was a really great trade for Minnesota there. The, I, I think it gives them one more threat to fight against the Eagles and the other top teams from the NFC East. Um, you know, really make a play for the conference and, and make it to a Super Bowl. But to get it from Detroit just felt like a pretty unlikely place. Yeah. The last team that I want to talk about for the trade stuff, um, what the fuck is the, is Chicago doing? Ge- genuinely, what the hell? Um, in the past couple of days, we saw them start to sell off pieces. Uh, Robert Quinn and Roquan Smith off their defense, uh, both of whom are fantastic players, and both of them, I believe, got traded under value. Um, obviously, love you know the Eagles getting a pickup for a fourth round pick, uh, and I think Roquan Smith will help his team as well. But after those trades where you're getting rid of valuable pieces, they also went and traded and got another wide receiver in Chase Claypool. I think Claypool is a great piece for the Bears, and he was a, a piece that last week when I said I think the Bears should be buying, I, I Chase Claypool is a great fit for that. But I think to lose the value that you did to pick up one more wide receiver for Justin Fields is just kind of strange, and I'm not sure what they're doing here. Uh, again, I think it's another build towards the future. I think they're okay losing games, knowing that maybe they can just have their offense start to kind of mesh together a little bit more. Um, and if they think Claypool is the you know the last piece that they want, then I mean this trade makes sense. So I'm guessing that's kind of what they're doing. But it, yeah, that's interesting. It's it's just interesting to me that their competitiveness this year has been like they've been a pretty low scoring team. Their defense has helped them win the games that they've won, right? To give away pieces like Ro- Roquan Smith and Robert Quinn just feels like a lot of loss to prove that Justin Fields is good. I just hits me very, very strange. Um, the last thing I want to talk about for trades is is uh, just me eating my own words from last week uh, where I talked about I didn't know how much impact Christian McCaffrey would have. Um, his first full performance with a full team walkthrough, the guy threw for a touchdown, ran for a touchdown, and caught a touchdown. And so I'll apologize to that man for still being that man. I think he makes San Francisco a whole lot scarier. And if we continue to see performances like this, it's only going to get better for him. Um, Agreed. Yeah. I, I mean, we, we've seen Christian just like blow everything out of the water on expectations. Like I would almost say 
if they keep performing at this level, they could be, you know, in the Super Bowl again. And especially against the Rams defense that, you know, is not like it's one of the better defenses. So to do that and, you know, it's pretty crazy. I, well, and just to know that he's so comfortable in that offense that you can already have him involved in trick plays to throw a touchdown, let alone just running and catching, I think is really impressive and really speaks to his value as an offensive performer wherever he goes. Um, that does kind of bring me in my next point, though, as you talked about the Super Bowl. Um, with this podcast, we'll be halfway through our podcast for regular season, although technically like only eight weeks have finished out of 17 or eight weeks out of 18 weeks. of football. You get the idea. Um, but. Uh, It does give up a pretty good opportunity to talk about the playoff picture. Um, So we'll start with the NFC just because I feel like it's the weaker conference easier to talk about. Um, If the playoffs started today, the Eagles would obviously have the bye. uh, But the 2-7 game would be Minnesota and San Francisco. At 3-6, you'd have Seattle and the Giants. And then at the 4-5 game, you'd have Atlanta and Dallas. What teams out of there surprise you? Who who maybe do you not expect to see there by season's end? What what are you thinking for the NFC playoff picture? Um, I mean, again, it's not the teams we expected to be in it. Like, you know, we talked at the beginning of this podcast in general of kind of who we expected to be good, who we expected to be great. And again, it's not the teams that we had said, like, we thought would be there. Um, you know, obviously, except for the few. But, like, we had discussed, like, yeah, the Eagles – They'll probably make, like, you know, some noise in the wild card. We didn't expect them to be this good. And, you know, where the Rams are just completely out of it. You know, it's just, it's a lot and it's, it's different. Um, but, again, like, I don't I don't think we really saw the teams that we expected or, yeah, to see. I, I think the interesting places for me for this are more just the matchups that we would get in the first round if things ended this way, right? I mean, obviously, we just watched Seattle and the Giants play. Seattle looked pretty handedly better like you could expect Seattle to move on Atlanta versus Dallas what we've seen so far this season you'd have to imagine that Dallas advances if they stay healthy but I think Minnesota San Francisco is a really good first round game that may just come down to home field Um, and Minnesota picking up that piece may have secured themselves that game against San Francisco if both teams continue this uptrend Um, but I, I think what's interesting to me is just how far ahead those first three teams I mentioned feel compared to the other four like as far as the NFC goes, I think the Eagles, the Vikings and the 49ers are all leagues ahead of Seattle, the Giants, Atlanta, Dallas. Like it's there's just seems to be so much separation between top and bottom. I find it very interesting. Yeah, I mean, I agree. We also, you know, with the Niners, we didn't expect them to be where they are right now. You know, like the thing is, even though they're still four and four, we're now discussing them as a Super Bowl team. Like it's just kind of that's kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, to move on, on to the AFC, um, the Bills have the bye, which makes this podcast look like front runners, but I swear to God we're not. Um, <laughs> so they'd get the bye. Uh, the 2-7 game would be Tennessee and the Chargers. The 3-6 uh, yeah, game would be Kansas City-Miami, and then the 4-5 game would be Baltimore and the Jets. Um, I guess what's most surprising to me at the moment is to see a game that – would matter between Tennessee and the Chargers. I know Tennessee is just the best in a bad division, which doesn't give them a whole lot of footing, Um, but they are still five and two. I can't talk too much shit. Um, I guess the Chargers still being there in that playoff picture with the teams that we've kind of seen surpass expectations, they're the really surprising ones. And I think that even though we've kind of tampered expectations for both these teams, I think they could still turn into a really good football game if that's what we get at the end of the year. Yeah, agreed. Um, definitely not the uh, the matchup I thought of. Um, I, I thought of, of course, the Dolphins and Chiefs um, because, you know, I'm an exciting person. I like fireworks. <laughs> um, so uh, definitely, I would be. I would love to see that just in general. And, you know, again, we talked about if we just had like a seven-game series between the Bills and the Chiefs. But, I mean, the Dolphins are still in that conversation for, you know, top teams. And they are, you know, we've talked about them and the Bills together. So, you know, that would be interesting to see just the Dolphins and Chiefs. That would be good. Yeah, I, I I would be super excited if the playoffs looked this way, specifically because it gives Kansas City a challenge early, right? I, I don't think Miami is any slouch. I think if they can manage to remain healthy by the time playoffs come around, like, I, I think they're a whole lot better on paper, I guess. My concern for looking at that now as it stands is I'm trying not to get myself too hyped for such an explosive matchup because I think Miami being healthy is going to bump them from 
the sixth seed to the fifth seed because I, like realistically i don't think they're catching buffalo but i mean i think they can overtake the jets for that that next spot where it'd be more realistic that they'd play baltimore instead of the jets playing baltimore but um yeah i, I do think that would be a good a good game i i i think it would be pretty unfortunate for miami fans to know that like they did have such a good year. They've looked so good. They've had their flashes of brilliance. And then to get the Chiefs at home in the first round would kind of suck. But um, yeah, exactly. I, know, just, uh, I, I definitely think looking at both those lists, though, um, that whoever comes out of the AFC feels immediately stronger than whoever comes out of the NFC. I mean, I, I would like to think that the Eagles could compete, but I've been saying it all season long that I think the Bills are a better team. Kansas City or Miami would both scare me. I, I think Baltimore plays a style that would scare the Eagles. Um, Minnesota, I don't mean to slouch on them at all. Obviously, we watched the Eagles beat them pretty handedly, but I still think Minnesota would go- make a good competitor if they got there. But I don't know how they match up against any of those teams as well. I mean, it, it definitely strikes me as the AFC is got to be feeling like a front runner for a Super Bowl. Yeah, again, I, but at the same time, you know, we discussed the Eagles, Vikings, and Niners. You know, we put those three in the group. Um, I think the Niners would actually stack really well against the Bills. I think that, like, again, from – I think it would be another Chiefs, like, Bills. Like, I think their offense now was secure in Christian McCaffrey. Like, I think it puts them scarier, and I think it, like, would really test the Bills, um, you know, going up against both decent defenses. Like, you know, um, it would be interesting to see. The one notable part of this, like just to look at teams and compare what's here is great, but I think just to look at these teams neglects the fact that this would be a playoffs if things ended this way. That doesn't include Tom Brady, doesn't include Aaron Rodgers, doesn't include Matt Stafford. Like there, there's a lot of really good talent in on an individual level that wouldn't make the playoffs here. Um, most notably from the NFC, I think, because we had some higher expectations. But I mean, there'd be a lot of really good teams missing the playoffs if things ended this way. Yeah, sure. All right. Um, some other things I wanted to talk about. Um, I, I'm going to kind of follow up on that that first round buy because I think it's going to be super important for this playoff p- picture since it only affects one team instead of multiple teams from each conference. Um, the place that I want to start is the Eagles, uh, just because I feel like there's a little bit bigger of a storyline with their schedule that follows up. Um, so they're ne- I know they've got 10 games left, but the opponents are the Texans. Washington a second time, Indy, the Packers, Titans, the Giants, the Bears, Dallas, the Saints, and the Giants again. Um, if, if you look at FPI percentages, which obviously neglects things like, you know, injury, struggle, whatever the case may be, right? FPI gives them a more than 70% chance to win all of those games except the one in Dallas, which like if you're just playing FPI and you're working too hard, that gives them a 16 in one season. The reason that that, like I think is so notable is because while that 16 and one would still get them the buy, I think that adds an immense amount of pressure late in the playoffs. Even when the NFC is weak, I think that creates a massive struggle, but like what games do you realistically see them losing or struggling in? Where, do, where do you see them at season's end knowing that's their strength of schedule? Um, again, I see them kind of finishing out. I would almost like be, again, we haven't seen, an undefeated team in a while so i mean i don't want to just go out and say they would be you know all season undefeated but again the only games i could even see them possibly losing is again cowboys and then maybe one or one and a half of the giants games but those are only like i think the eagles are still better than both of those teams but i think they might have a little bit difficulty but i fully expect the eagles to kind of end up even 17 and 0 here yeah, I, look, Dallas in Dallas scares me. It's very hard to beat the same team in the same season twice. Like, even to lose one of the Giants games, I don't think would upset me. Like, and in the grand scheme of things, like, I think there's a lot of pressure that goes into a team being 17 and 0 versus 14 or, you know, 14 and 3, whatever, right? Like, I, I know that the Packers still have talent on the field and you know it's football any given week right the the titans are better than we've given them credit for this season like you know even washington's another division game that like you never know what happens right but i mean it's hard for me to look at the eagles as giving up that first or that buy in the nfc with that schedule left on their docket knowing how much space there is between them and everybody else um alternatively i think the bills schedule actually has some real challenges that we're going to know a lot more by the about the bills by season's end. Um, they get the jets, the Vikings, the Browns, lions, Patriots, 
Jets again, Dolphins, Bears, Bengals, Patriots again. Um, we've talked last week about that the Jets were better than the, we think they are. Um, I think getting the Jets twice, same as I said for the Eagles, that like winning against a division opponent twice is very difficult. But uh, we've seen the Lions offense be really good that I think could, you know, not necessarily beat the Bills, but challenge the Bills. The Vikings are very good. We watched the Browns offense score in a really well this past week in a game that they weren't necessarily supposed to. We obviously learned a lot from the first Dolphins game and you get them again. What do you see being most realistic for what the Bills have left on the docket? Um, I mean, at the same time, like, yes, some of these like matchups are going to be a challenge. But like at the same time, I still think that the difference between, you know, the next even Chiefs Dolphins to the Bills is like so much of a gap that I still expect you know, the Bills to come out winning almost all of them. Again, yes, the challenge will be there, but I think they're securing the pieces that they need and kind of being themselves into, like, they're okay with that and, like, they'll still come out on top, so. Yeah, I mean, grand scheme of things, I I, I do realistically see the Bills being good enough to hold on to that bye, um, but I think that their path to getting that bye is a whole lot more difficult than it is for the Eagles, and I, I think there's more of a struggle with teams like Miami and Kansas City basically right behind them. I mean, even Tennessee, I, I haven't looked up their exact schedule, but I, I like even Tennessee being six and two, I think there's not as much of a gap there, you know, between the bills and Titans as we thought there were. And, you know, you, the Titans play in an easy division to get some freer wins than the, than the bills do that. I, I think it's going to be a much harder path. Yeah. Um, I guess that moves us into our fantasy information for the week, uh, which is officially where I stopped talking because I one of my fantasy leagues I lost two hundred and twelve to eighty nine this week. I have no right to speak. <laughs> How did you even do that? Like, uh, let me let me find his uh, his exact roster here because he had five different thirty point scorers. Um, all right, he had Kyler Murray get him twenty five, which is a solid day. But Alvin Kamara, who went off for 43, Nick Chubb for 25, uh, A.J. Brown for almost 40, DeAndre Hopkins for 34, uh, and then Foreman for 32. Like, I just left, right, and sideways. All of his players just exploded. I I, I got annihilated. They know it was a bad week for me anyway with less than 90 points. But if I had doubled my score, I still lost by double digits. It, it doesn't even matter. Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I agreed. Like, it was kind of... Um... Talk like some of the names that you talked about. Um, again, we haven't seen Kamara really be that star, you know, extra 30 points, you know, um, in fantasy. So when I saw it, I thought I was going crazy. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> and it said three total TDs. And I was like, oh my gosh. Um, again, like I, I spent like a first round pick on him. So to have him finally come through was definitely nice. Um, again, some of those names just kind of exploded. Um, again, we didn't anticipate it, but. Um, I, I mean, AJ Brown set a career high for receiving yards and having his three touchdowns in the same game. McCaffrey was a super high value, just three total touchdowns in three different ways, really getting involved in the offense. But uh, DeAndre Hopkins coming back proved to be really fruitful. Like there were just guys in the league this week that were super explosive. Yeah, agreed. Um, you know, talking about DeAndre Hopkins, I mean, like again, we're seeing an explosive now Cardinals offense. So I think they're back. That's all. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> well, if there was a week to question them, it was this week, uh, especially against a team like the Vikings. But I mean, I guess they held their own. Their offense looked pretty solid. So I, I guess for the Cardinals sake that I, I just hope it's sustainable and something continues, whatever that means. But um, to move on from fantasy, I think we'll get into gambling. Uh, I told you all that this was the week that I was actually legally going to be able to put money on it. Uh, cause I'd be in a state that allows it. And let me tell you what, I probably shouldn't have, uh, only ended up with like a net loss of $7, but still I lost more games than I won. So, um, so for here for the podcast last week, uh, Noah went four and 11, uh, for a total of 47, 75 and one. It's, it's starting to get rough out there for you, bud. Uh, mine was still a losing week, uh, but it's seven and eight for a total of 55, 67 and one. Um, this week has some massive spreads that terrify the shit out of me. Um, uh, we also have six teams on a buy, so the slate's going to look a little more empty than it did this past week, but, uh, we'll start on Thursday night. Eagles at Houston. Uh, Eagles are 13 and a half point favorites. 
it's a big way to start. I'm terrified of these big spreads because the Eagles can look absolutely dominant, play a really good game, and still not cover because it's 13 and a half. That being said, I think Houston's pretty bad. They're super not noteworthy. I don't think their defense is going to have any answer for A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith or even Miles Sanders, to be completely honest with you, if everybody's doing their job. So I'm going to take the Eagles, but at 13 and a half, I can tell you I don't feel good about it. Uh, I'm going Texans because, again, we've seen the Texans still put up points. Yes, they're losing, but they're still putting up something. So I'm actually going to say that they probably keep this within 13 and a half points. I, it's, it's a lot of points. It's terrifying as hell. If it was the Bills, I'd feel so much better. <laughs> you know, it would so much better. Um, next game I've got is the Colts and the Patriots. Uh, Patriots are five and a half favorites at home. This one I kind of don't know what to do with. Um, I, I get like I like the Patriots, but I don't know that I trust the Patriots. Uh, and the Colts just feel like they're keeping most of their games close, even when they're losing every single week. Um, I think I'm going to take the Colts and the points. Um, agreed. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to go Patriots, even though I despise that. Um, I, I do think that maybe the Colts kind of flounder here and then, you know, the Patriots are able to at least keep a touchdown over them. So I'm going Patriots. I yeah, will see. That one is another one that could really go either way with the spread. But uh, next one I've got is the Bills and the Jets. Bills are 12 and a half point favorites on the road. Listen, I just said it. If I know. it was the Bills, I'm taking it. So I'm taking it. Buffalo. All right. I'm going to regret it, but I'm going to do the same thing I did a few weeks ago. 12 and a half points is hard to cover. The Jets have still been pretty decent on offense. I'm going to take the Jets. I will say, though, that if Buffalo was at home, I would take Buffalo and not think about it twice. I'm going to take the Jets. Um, Next I have is Dolphins Bears. Uh, Dolphins are five point favorites on the road. For me, after the trade deadline, the things that we saw move for the Bears... I don't know how early they can get uh, Chase Claypool involved in a meaningful way to be able to score better than they have been, and then losing two really important pieces on offense or on defense rather uh, allows the Dolphins to really get to work. We know the Dolphins can score. I'm taking Miami. Uh, I'm gonna go with you here. Agreed. Um, again, we just don't know how much the Bears are gonna perform now. Um, Watch, they're going to, like, blow the Dolphins right out. But <laughs> <laughs> That's the way gambling goes, man. You're just here to lose money. Um, I have the Packers and the Lions. Uh, Packers are three and a half favorites on the road. I have been watching the Packers flounder week after week after week. Just not look good. Admittedly, they looked better than I expected them to against a team like Buffalo, but the way we watched the Lions' offense come back into form and the struggles that we've watched the Packers have, I'm going to take the Lions on the points, especially at home. Uh, Agreed. I was going to go Lions either way, um, especially at home. And again, we haven't seen the Packers team that we originally thought, and I think the Lions are going to win this one. Uh, I have the Vikings and Washington. The Vikings are only three and a half point favorites on the road. Uh, for me, that feels super easy to just take the Vikings. They add another offensive piece, and I already think they're better than four points against Washington. Yeah, agreed. Vikings all the way for that. Um, I have the Panthers and the Bengals. Bengals are seven and a half favorites at home. Um After watching what I saw this past week, the Bengals really struggled. Um, The Panthers appear to have found their offense after losing two offensive pieces because we've watched them do it twice now. Um, Seven and a half feels like a really big spread for this game, so I'm taking Carolina. Uh, Unfortunately, as much as I would love to pick Bengals, yeah, I'm going to have to pick Carolina. I don't think that they're seven points better than the Panthers right now, or even six and a half, sorry. Um, But yeah, Panthers. Uh, next one I've got is Chargers Falcons. Chargers are three point favorites on the road. Um, this is a really, really tough one for me. Um, the Falcons can still score. They're not winning every week, but they're still scoring. Um, the Chargers haven't flattered me. I think that on paper, like just to look at their rosters, like the Chargers are a better team, but it's very, very hard to trust them. I guess I'm going to take the Chargers just coming off a bye week. You can hope that they rest it up and can bring something extra to the Atlanta game, but I don't feel good about it either way. 
Um, I'm going Falcons. Uh, I think Marcus Mariota is doing something, and I'm, I'm liking what I'm seeing. I think they're right now. Um, they're better than the Chargers. Um, again, the last time we saw them was a, two weeks ago. So um, but I still think Falcons win this. Uh, I have the Raiders and the Jaguars. Raiders are one and a half favorites on the road. Um, I, for me, this game is kind of just a snoozer. Like, it doesn't really matter who wins, and it being one and a half kind of tells me the odds makers feel the same way. I'm going to go in Vegas because I believe them to be better than their record suggests, and I think the Jags on a big slide. I don't know that it stops against a team we've seen be average-ish, I guess. Uh, yeah, I, I think I'm going to take take the Raiders and feel okay. Uh, I think at home we're going to find the Jags something, so I'm going to go Jags. But again, it doesn't really matter. So <laughs> yeah, grand scheme of things, you can all but chalk them both off. Um, I have the Seahawks and the Cardinals. Cardinals are minus two at home, uh, two point favorites. Um, look, I, I think the Cardinals offense did show me that they're here to succeed. It showed me that Kyler Murray is ready to show out and play. Being at home obviously gives them a big advantage. Um, and obviously what they were doing this week with DeAndre Hopkins is just massively impressive already. But it's hard for me to pick against the Seahawks when they've been doing this week after week after week, even against teams that I expect to be good. Uh, I'm going to just keep riding the Seahawks for what they're doing because I really got nothing else to work off of. Uh, I'm going to go Cardinals just because I think that, again, we've seen their offense kind of round back. Um, I think the Seahawks will keep it close. But, you know, for two points, um, I'm going Cardinals. Uh, this one was a difficult one uh, for me, but I have the Rams at the Bucks. Bucks are two and a half favorites at home. If you had told me this game was coming in week nine preseason, I would have been so hyped. This would have been a much watch, must watch game. At this point in the season, the way things have gone, I could not give any less of a shit at all. I'm going to take the Bucks. I'm hoping that, you know, Brady can turn it around because it's going to feel really uh, like an asterisk season if somebody wins a Super Bowl that Brady didn't make the playoffs. Um, and I just don't think the Rams have shown me even the smallest amount of upswing. Uh, I mean, agreed. You make valid points. Um, however, I'm still riding Rams. I don't like the Bucks, anyways. So Rams it is. <laughs> I mean, it'd be nice if they could both lose, but I like that's just that's a difficult one to pick at two and a half. Yeah. Um, another big spread uh, for Sunday night. I have the Titans at the Chiefs. Chiefs are twelve and a half favorites at home. This is tough because it's another big spread. I think the Chiefs are at least twelve and a half points better than the Titans if they played a hundred times, but. The Titans have, they, I know they started the season slow, but it seems like they've got their shit together. The Chiefs have been keeping most of their games closer than they should be. Uh, but that being said, as hard as it is for me to say so, uh, Andy Reid has a bye week buff, uh, and them not playing this week means they're going to win this week. Like, it's just a guaranteed. I didn't care if that spread was 40. I'm taking the Chiefs, but I just want you all to know the big spread scares me. Um, I'm actually going to go to Titans because I think that the Titans are, you know, we said it, like Titans are better than we're giving them credit for. I think they're going to keep this a little bit closer than 12 and a half. Um, again, I guess it, we're just going to see, you know, the divisional game and I think it's starting to matter. Um, but I think I'm going with Titans just because I don't think the Chiefs will win by 12 and a half. Yeah, I, I, it's hard for me to take that one that way, but Andy Reid gets a bye week buff, man. He did it like. 14 out of 16 years with the Eagles or some some ridiculous number like that. Like, it just, he can't lose. Um, last game I've got is Monday night. It's the Ravens at the Saints. Ravens are two and a half favorites on the road. Um, the, the Ravens, I think, are significantly better than three points against the Saints. Playing on the road is hard, uh, but got to take the Ravens there. Yeah, um, as much as I would love to take the Saints and maybe say, you know, they're Kamara's back. Um, I do. I do think the Ravens just have too much power and strength, so I'm going Ravens as well. All right. Uh, as always, lines are provided by FanDuel as of Tuesday. Are subject to change by game time. Please gamble responsibly and remember that we're not providing gambling advice. Solely providing our picks, especially since I lost a ton of money this week. Uh, if you or a loved one has a gambling problem, please call one eight hundred Gambler. Um, short one this week, but. Uh, Going to definitely make an effort to sit down and watch more football. Much more concerted next week since I didn't catch much of any this week. Um, 
we'll uh we'll have another long one for you next week we'll uh you know look at some maybe some mvp races where divisions and stuff stand and uh it'll be a good halfway check in for the season so uh with that i think we're just about wrapped up and we will see you guys uh next week